This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. How are you doing today? Today's a great day. How are you? I am doing great as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Awesome. I would like to welcome everybody back to this week's episode. And before I start, I would like to remind everyone to please hit the subscribe or follow button on whatever app you're listening to. On August 2nd, 1982, the Johnson family, Dad Bob, he was 44, Mom Jackie, she was 41, and their daughters Janet, 13, and Karen, 11, along with Jackie's parents, 66-year-old George and 59-year-old Edith Bentley, set off for a summer vacation in the Wells Gray Park. Wells Gray Park is located in British Columbia, Canada, about 300 miles northeast of Vancouver. Wow, that's really north. Mm -hmm. I bet it's even cold in the summer there, right? I wonder. I'm just saying. I know. It's pretty high up there. Bob was really looking forward to the two-week camping trip, He told his co-workers how excited he was to go fishing. He said he was going to get in some of the best fishing of his life in Wells Gray Park, and that he was excited that his daughters were going to have a great time camping and experiencing the outdoors. Wow. I don't think my 13 and 11-year-old would be as excited. (laughs) I think I've always hated camping. (laughs) I'm pretty sure my 13 and 11-year-old would kick my ass if I told him we were going two weeks in Canada camping. Yeah. Yeah. My family went camping when I was a kid, and I hated it. Anyway, Edith was a typical grandmother. She loved to cook and bake, and not just for her family. She was known to bake a fabulous huckleberry pie. Huckleberry pie? Yeah. and What is that? I'm going to tell you. And she had heard that Wells Gray Park had an abundance of berries for her pies. So you want to know what huckleberry pie is. I haven't had it either, obviously, and I looked it up. Google told me that the berries used in huckleberry pie are not one specific berry, like blueberries or raspberries, but berries that range in color from red, blue, and black. They're similar to blueberries, and they even taste like blueberries. So I don't know why they're not part of the blueberry family, but they're not. Wow. Well, now I know. Now you know. They're not something you find at a local grocery store because I guess they're really difficult to domesticate. Anywho, now you know, and they're only common in the Pacific Northwest. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. So anybody wants a huckleberry pie? (laughs) Tanya can give you the recipe. Let's get to some fucking true crime. (laughs) George had recently retired, and George is the grandpa, from his job in a lumber mill and had bought a brand new heavy-duty Ford pickup truck and a camper that rested in the bed of the truck just for this trip. He also hauled an aluminum boat with an outboard motor along with the camper, and everyone was really excited to visit this park. It was the first time they had all been there after hearing all kinds of wonderful things about it, notably how beautiful the park was and how it was a great place to camp and fish. The Bentleys planned to meet their daughter and her family in Clearwater, which is located high in the Columbia Mountain Range of the Rocky Mountains. Clearwater is where the park is. So they're actually going to a campground, right? Yes. Where other campers would be? Yes. Yes. Other campers do camp in that park. Yes. The Johnsons brought a tent for the girls to sleep in, along with their sleeping bags, and the adults planned to sleep in the Bentley's camper. The Johnsons left their home on August 2nd, 1982, and packed up the family car. The camping gear went in a car top carrier on their 1979 Plymouth Cavell. The families were going to meet together before going to Wells Gray Park. However, the Johnsons first stopped to visit friends in Red Deer, Alberta, and the Bentleys checked into a campsite on August 8th, about 250 miles northwest of Calgary. It wasn't Wells Gray Park. But eventually they met up and they all arrived to Wells Gray Park. When they first got there, they searched for an appropriate place to set up camp. They didn't want to be near any crowds or group of people, so they stayed away from the more popular main park campsites. Oh, I don't know, man. And instead, they found the abandoned remnants of the old Bear Creek prison site. You're kidding me. <laughs> they are camping in the, the building's remnants. not there. Yeah, they're the building's not there. Just okay. to let you know. It's Still, not like they're camping I'm... at some spooky building, but 
I know. They are camping where a prison once was. Yes. It was actually a perfect spot to camp, they felt, and set up a tent for the girls because most of the area was flat and had been cleared. Okay. Okay. It was also very close to the lake, so fishing would be easily accessible. The family unloaded the camper onto four flat cement pads nearby, and the girls set up the tent within minutes, anxious to start their adventure. So these cement flat pads are were once the grounds of the prison, I and that's where so, they're yes. setting up the camp? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The first night the family stayed at the campsite, they built a fire and sat around it, roasting marshmallows and making plans to go fishing the following morning. As morning came, there was no sleeping in because the girls were so excited. They were up at sunrise. Really? Mm -hmm. They put on their bathing suits, and they were ready to start their day even before the adults had managed to make breakfast. What year is this? 82. Yeah, it's before the internet. (laughs) There's nothing to do. No cell phone. I know. There's absolutely nothing to do. After breakfast, the girls spent the day exploring the woods and even caught a small fish in the afternoon. After catching the fish, they headed to the campsite to show Bob and Jackie And as they were heading back, they noticed some movement in the trees. Figuring it was nothing but the small animals they encountered during their exploration, they didn't think anything more of it. That night, the family gathered around the campfire again to not only talk about the fun that they had had that day, but again made plans for the following day. The girls decided they were going to check out the old prison site to see if they could find any ghosts of prisoners long gone. So there must be some more... There's gotta be, yeah, there's got to be something. I don't think, though, that there was much left, from what I understand. But there probably was a little something left. Cinder blocks, bricks, things like that. Yeah, probably. So they were going to explore for ghosts? For ghosts. Fun. And they headed to bed. The next morning, Edith took the girls to the old prison site and let them explore while she harvested huckleberries. That is so cute. Isn't that cute? I can just see it. They returned to the campsite in time for dinner. After dinner, the family gathered around the campfire to talk about another great day spent at Wells Great Park. The girls didn't make it long. After spending the day running around in the sun, and after roasting some marshmallows, they went to their tent to sleep. The girls had almost fallen asleep when they heard a loud crash. Looking toward the tent door, they heard screaming, yelling, and muffled voices. Then two more loud crashing sounds, one right after the other, that were a little further away than the first. Janet tried to unzip the tent zipper and had gotten about halfway when she realized someone on the outside was trying to unzip it, too. Oh, no. I know, that's a little scary. From the outline, it looked like it was their mom, Jackie. And as the zipper slowly rose to where they could make eye contact, another crashing sound was made. This time, it seemed like it was right outside the tent. Janet jumped back in fear, and when she got up, Jackie was no longer there. So it was her mom trying to open it? Yes, it was her mom trying to open it. There were no noises coming from outside anymore, and about a minute later, another figure approached the tent and unzipped it. Two large male hands opened the tent door, and a man's face peeked into the tent to see the two terrified girls. The family was supposed to return from their vacation on August 16th. On August 23rd, Al Bonar, who was the manager of Gorman Mills, where Bob worked, he called the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP. Because Bob hadn't shown up for work? Yeah, he called because, yeah, Bob hadn't returned to work as planned. Bob had never used a sick day or pulled a no-show in the 20 years he had worked there. Al was worried because, obviously, this was unusual. Because they were supposed to be back, like, a week prior. And he told the police this was just not something Bob would do. He told them the Johnson family had gone on a camping and fishing trip to Wells Gray Park and that Bob had missed about a week of work so far. A missing persons report was filed and given to Sergeant Baruda at the Clearwater Department, the police department. Clearwater is where the park is, who then forwarded it to Cam Loop's department, and it was given to Sergeant Mike Easton. And Sergeant Easton was the head of the Serious Crimes Unit for the Interior of British Columbia. So we have Sergeant Baruda of Clearwater and Sergeant Easton, the head of Serious Crimes Unit. So why do they assume it's a crime and not some sort of accident? They're... Well, I think they just are investigating it, and that's probably who ended up with it. The report circulated, and photos of the Johnson and Bentleys accompanied the report. I'm assuming they searched for them, too, right? All over Wells Gray Park? Yeah. 
They did. It's a huge park, so they don't know where to search first. So they have to send out this missing persons. It has to get out there so that they can at least get some tips of people maybe that have seen them. So the first tip that came in was from a gas station attendant about 40 miles from Clearwater who remembered seeing the six family members stop and fill up the Ford truck. Edith had asked him if he knew a good place to pick huckleberries. The tips continued to come in, and police searched for the family with no luck. On September 13, 1982, a man told the police he remembered seeing the Johnson's car while he was out picking mushrooms in Wells Great Park in late August. So this is about a month after they went camping, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. He told them he saw a burned-out Chrysler in the woods just off Battle Mountain Road. The area in which the man had described seeing the burned-out car was a horseback riding trail, which was almost too rough for a car or truck to travel on. Sergeant Baruta drove to the area and saw from the road there were tire tracks that led into the brush where the horseback trail was. He got out of his car and followed the tire marks and soon found what had been reported. It was just a shell of the vehicle it once was. It was burned out. He called in the license plate number and soon other officers arrived to investigate. Sergeant Easton was called when one of the officers noticed what looked like skeletal remains inside of the car. Sergeant Easton looked inside and saw bone fragments in the back seat. He next examined the trunk. Once opened, he stared inside and looking back at him were the skulls of two children. One skull had a hole over the left eye socket and Easton thought it looked like a possible exit wound from a bullet. Sergeant Eason was pretty sure he was looking at the remains of the Johnson and Batling families. The forensic team collected what they could, bone fragments in the skulls from the victims. A lot of the bone fragments just turned to ash. Really? Yeah, it burned hot. An accelerant was definitely used. And the medical examiner confirmed through dental records that the remains found were Bob, Jackie, George, Edith, Janet, and Karen. On the same day that the bodies were found, the surviving Johnson and Bentley families were notified before the media broke the news. I'm going to tell you, this story was hot in Canada. It was all over the media. So was it the Johnson's car? Yes, it was the Johnson's car. And all six of them were inside it. Yes, and it had been set on fire. Is it a big car? They didn't even have I think it was a sedan. Right, really? I, I think it was a sedan. So I don't think it was a very big car. Oh, and you said two were in the trunk. Mm-hmm. The police focused next on finding George's truck in camper, hoping that the killer or killers were stupid enough to just be driving it around. They put out an APB on the truck, which seemed to be quite conspicuous. The truck was red and gray, and the camper front window was painted with a bright orange sunset. Oh, I'm geez. Sure, I'm sure there's not many of those, right? Right. <laughs> the first tip came in. And it was from someone who had followed the truck and camper to a gas station where two men got out. Another tip came in from one of the attendants at Wells Gray Park, who said he saw it near the old Bear Creek prison site. Sergeant Eastham and his officers went to the prison site and searched it. They found items they were able to link to the family, such as canning lids and beer bottle caps. So that's the site where they were camping. Yeah. So they found it. Mm -hmm, They found it. A further search was conducted that found beers in the riverbed, which probably kept them cool, and six 22 caliber spent shell casings. They found the fire pit with the six seats around it and the sticks the family used to roast marshmallows. Police realized they found where the murders had occurred. No further leads materialized, and by April 1983, the case was in danger of becoming cold. It's crazy to think you can get away with killing six six murders. People. I know, it's crazy. By then, cash rewards were being offered $7,500 for information leading to where George's truck was, and $35,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of who killed the family. The police decided they needed a new approach to the case and rolled out a publicity campaign across Canada that involved driving across the country in a truck with a camper that looked exactly like George Bentley's. The timing of the cross-country drive coincided with a televised reenactment of the crime, and this was all done with the hopes of jogging the memories of anyone with information to help solve the murders. The trip lasted for 15 days, and after the officers completed the trip, the police were receiving tips at the same rate as they were when the murders first happened. So it really did generate a lot of new memories from people. One tip led them to Detroit, 
But right before making plans to cross the border, Sergeant Eastham received a call that the truck had been found. It was burned out like the Johnson's car had been and located in a wooded area in Kamloops. The discovery was made on October 18, 1983, by two forestry workers in Trophy Mountain, which is about 4,700 feet above sea level. The workers said they had first discovered the truck a few weeks prior, but didn't report it because they were staying in a ranger cabin deep in the park and had no TV. So they didn't know what they had found until later, right before they had reported it. Since the truck was located in such a remote area, it told the police that the killer or killers were people who knew the area well and was probably either from Clearwater or had close family there. So the truck wasn't far from the crime scene then? No, the truck wasn't far from the crime scene or where they found the car. While police examined the truck, they noticed that someone had planted tree seeds in the ground around it. This was probably done by the perpetrators because of the $7,500 reward for finding the truck. The killers were the only ones who were motivated enough to hide the truck and not collect the money. That's true. They also found a bullet hole in the door on the passenger side of the truck that Sergeants Eastham and Baruta decided to keep quiet. That way they could rule out false confessions or bad tips. Finding the truck, the police were prompted to do a door-to-door canvassing of Clearwater and the Wells Gray area. While conducting the canvassing, the name David Shearing came up again and again. One woman told the police that David lived on a ranch out on Wells Gray Road in an area called Tumbler Ridge and had mentioned finding a vehicle in the mountains that had a bullet hole in one of the doors. He had asked her husband if he knew how to register a stolen vehicle and how to fix a bullet hole in the car door. Hmm. Hmm. David lived in Tumbler Ridge, a town that was in its first stages of being developed, and he moved there to find work in construction. Many of the construction workers there lived in work camps, but some lived outside of the camps because they didn't want to pay dues to the camp. David was one of those guys erecting a small cabin out of stolen building materials on land belonging to someone else. He made his own cabin? Mm-hmm. He lived there with other workers he had met after moving there. David soon didn't have a job because he was pretty lazy, as were the others who lived with him, and they all turned burglary to make ends meet. In September 1982, RCMP officer Ron German was out on patrol. And he's in the Clearwater, Tumbler Ridge area. He noticed a large Ford pickup truck go by that initially didn't catch his attention. Lots of men in Tumblr Ridge drove pickup trucks, so it wasn't an unusual sight. But on second look, he noticed that the bed of the truck held a lot of tools, and even though that also didn't seem suspicious, the little voice in Officer German's head got the better of him. He pulled the truck over, and as soon as he pulled behind the truck on the shoulder of the road, the driver got out of the vehicle and started walking toward him. This was not the move to make. I mean, the police always tell you stay in your vehicle. So Officer German got out of the car quickly and told the man to stay put. Mm. While turning on his off-road lights, which blinded the driver, as well as the two passengers that were in the truck. After seeing the man's driver's license and identifying him as David Shearing, Officer German questioned him about the tools in the truck. While David explained what was in the truck, Officer German noticed that the passengers hadn't moved at all not even to look around to see what was happening. This seemed very suspicious to him, and so he placed David in the back of his cruiser and went to investigate. He walked around the rear of his vehicle and came upon the truck from the passenger side. He wanted to retain an element of surprise in case one or both of the men had a weapon. As he approached the passenger door, he noticed one of the men had a 30 30 rifle cocked across his lap, ready to fire at the driver's door. Officer German knew that he would have been dead had he not decided to approach the vehicle from the passenger side. He was able to recover the rifle without further incident and arrested the man that had it on his lap for attempted murder. There were no reports of stolen tools, so he ended up letting David and the other man go. However, the next morning he got a call from one of the engineer trailers in the construction camp stating that a lot of tools had been stolen. Officer German knew he had pulled over the guilty parties. So he arrested one guy for attempted Attempted murder, murder, who seems a little over the top. Yeah, and that guy ended up getting let out. Yeah, he ended up getting let out. So those charges didn't stick. He and another officer headed to David Shearing's shack in the woods. They found David and the other passenger. His name was Wyman Leighton, 
he ended up taking them in for stealing the tools. Around this time, Sergeant Eastham had planned to travel to Dawson's Creek, which oh. I believe is nearby. Really? Is that what yeah. the show's based off of? I, I wonder. It's I've a real never place. Seen it. I know me either. He wanted to question David in connection with the Johnson Bentley murders, and he had asked Officer German to keep it quiet that he was coming to visit. Officer German got David to go with him to the Dawson's Creek Police Station, and when they arrived, they were greeted by Sergeant Easton. Upon seeing Sergeant Easton, David's eyes grew wide with fear. He knew through news reports that Sergeant Easton was the lead on the Johnson Bentley murders. David was led into an interview room while Sergeant Easton and Officer German spoke. Officer German told him that David always looked down when confronted with a crime that he was guilty of committing. Oh, he must have committed a lot of crimes if they know that about him. Mm -hmm. And with that, Easton went to greet David again and begin his interview. Sergeant Easton first started the interview by asking David about his life, putting him at ease. And I'd like to let everyone know, I read a book for this case. It was called Murder Time Six, The True Story of the Wells Gray Park Murders by Alan R. Warren. So the book goes into detail about the conversation they had. They're just like shooting the shit. Sergeant Easton told David that they were just talking, but if David wanted an attorney, he could have one. But why do you need one? We're just talking. Yeah, we're just, we're just talking. And talking. you know, you're free to leave anytime you want. But David, why don't you stay? I know, but let's chit chat. David asked him point blank if he was investigating the Johnson Bentley murders. And instead of answering him, Sergeant Easton asked him, was anyone question you about it? And David told him, yes, he had been questioned about it. Then Easton told him that the investigation led police to uncover a bunch of crimes, things not even related to the mass murders. He told David he wanted to know if David was going to be honest with him and asked him about a hit and run that occurred on Wells Gray Road a couple of years back in which a young man was killed. David was visibly relieved after now believing that Sergeant Easton wasn't there to talk about the Johnson Bentley murders. As they talked about the hit and run, David admitted he had been the one who had hit the guy. He hit a guy and left him to die Mm -hmm. on the road? Yes. He had been drinking, Uh driving drunk, and had been heading home with a friend, Doug, when he felt his vehicle run over something. Oh. He said the whole car bounced, and he realized he ran over someone and not something. He fled the scene because he was scared. David had pulled the car over at one point, and the two men saw that the bumper was damaged, so they yanked it off the car, and they decided together they were not going to tell the police about what happened. Sergeant Easton asked him if he knew the victim, and David said he had. He he, knew the guy he ran over and left to die? Yes. And he told Sergeant Easton, you know, he was really upset about it. Oh, Oh, okay. But I was scared. And he told Sergeant Easton that he didn't think anyone but he and Doug knew about the hit and run. Easton told him pretty much everyone knew except the police. Everyone knew that he did it. Mm Mm-hmm. And then he asked David if he wanted to write a confession down on paper. David agreed. And after writing the confession, he asked Sergeant Easton, what now? And said he was ready to leave. Oh, God. (laughs) What a dumbass. What a dumbass. Sergeant Easton told him, well, I am investigating the Johnson Bentley murders, and I want to go over your written statement with you. Now. About that case? About the hit and run, because he had just written out the statement. David wanted to know if he was going to jail for the hit and run, and Sergeant Easton told him that decision was up to the prosecutor. They talked more about how it must have felt good for David to get the story out, like get it off his chest. And Sergeant Easton then asked him about the Johnson Bentley murders. He asked if David knew where the car and truck had been found, basically saying they were in David's backyard because David was from that area. And David acknowledged he knew the area. Easton asked him if he knew where the families were killed, and David told him Bear Creek. Easton knew that nobody in the public really knew where the family was killed. And how would David know this? David realized he must have made a mistake by saying it because he then stated he needed to talk to an attorney now. Yeah, I'm going to need an attorney I'm going to need an attorney now. Got to open my big fat mouth up. <laughs> Dumbass. Easton said he thought he needed a lawyer too, but that he also needed to talk to David some more. Technically, David never specifically asked for a lawyer and only said he needed to talk to one. So Eastman forged on. Oh, okay. Technicality, it's very thin ice. Yeah, that's very thin ice in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. 
David eventually confessed to the murders, and before I tell you what he had to say, we're going to take a break. I want to take a second to thank Surfshark for sponsoring this episode. Surfshark has a great product. Surfshark provides you with a VPN. What's a VPN and why is it important? A VPN is a virtual private network, and it's important because it helps stop hackers. But there's a lot of other cool features with a VPN. I can have a virtual location pretty much anywhere in the world. And what makes that cool is it seems like I'm in Maltese right now, which throws off hackers, but it also does something really cool in regards to entertainment. I can now access shows on Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, and other streaming platforms I couldn't access before because it's all based on your location. For example, if I was in Maltese and I'd already seen all the true crime shows from Netflix based in the United States, I could access Netflix Maltese shows. It's all about the virtual location. Hackers, trackers, and malware is hiding all over the internet, and Surfshark will help you protect yourself from them. Get your own VPN through Surfshark, risk-free, with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you go to surfshark.deals slash crimes and enter the promo code CRIMES, you can get 83% off and three extra months free. That's surfshark.deals slash crimes, and you use our promo code crimes. When you do that, you not only help support Surfshark, but you help support us too. David said he saw the truck and camper one evening on his way home from work, the Johnson and Bentley's truck and camper. He went for a walk after going home and found himself at the campsite where he saw the family camping and he saw the truck that he had seen earlier. So they have a truck and a camper, but then they have a sedan too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the camper is in the bed of the truck. The pickup truck. Okay. It's one of those. So like the top of it hangs over the hood of the cab of the pickup truck. I have a picture of it, so I will post it. David was curious and wanted to watch the family. So he found a spot in the bushes above the camper and watched. That's creepy. Isn't it? He got scared at one point thinking that one of them may have spotted him. So he ran away and hid in some shrubs across a field from where the campers were. Once he realized he hadn't been followed, he went home. The next night, he went back to the campsite to again spy on the family. He brought a rifle with him this time, and instead of watching the family from the bushes above the camper, he walked into the campsite and started firing, killing the adults as they sat around the campfire. Then he went to the tent and killed the children. He loaded all the bodies into the Johnson's car, placing adults in the back seat and the children in the trunk. He then collected the family's belongings from around the campfire and threw the items into the camper. He drove the car, then the truck, into a clearing of the field he had ran through the previous evening. Then he went home and came back to the scene the following day. So he is telling the police he just did this mass slaughter for no reason. Yeah. And the day he did it, he just left the vehicles there. He came back the next day, and that's when he took everything he thought was worth keeping and drove the car to Battle Mountain and set it on fire. Two days later, he said he drove the truck to Trophy Mountain and disposed of it in the same manner. He initially didn't want to torch the truck, where it was eventually found, but it got stuck in the mud, and he had no other choice. He claimed he only stalked the family before killing them all, stealing their belongings, and then setting all the evidence on fire. But that wasn't the entire story. So he's lying. He's lying, for the most part. I mean, I think the shell is there, but pretty much... The details? The details. He's full of shit right now. The case had gotten extensive media coverage, and it was a relief that someone had been arrested for these heinous crimes. The people of Clearwater had been terrified and began to arm themselves when they walked around town. The children weren't allowed to go outside alone, and women walked in groups of three or four. No one was visiting Wells Gray Park. Oh, I bet. Yeah, which was completely devastating to the community because it relied heavily on tourism, especially in the summer when families and groups went there to camp and fish. I wouldn't go there after Fuck that. no. <laughs> Hell no. Hell no. Mm-mm. When David's mother found out he'd been arrested, she didn't want to believe her son was capable of such a terrible crime. She hoped it was just a bad dream or a case of mistaken identity and told the press that David had always been a good boy. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> really. Sergeant Eastham arranged to bring David back to Clearwater from Dawson's Creek where he was being held, and he also arranged for David to reenact the crimes for them. When it came time for the reenactment, like, they took him out to Wells Gray Park. Wow, like, hardcore. Actual reenactment, yeah. Holy cow. David had a little trouble at first because it was now wintertime and everything looked a little different. 
However, David was able to show them what happened, and he answered their questions, with one of them being, was everyone dead when he set the car on fire? And he told them, yes, everyone was dead. They then took him to his shack in the woods, and he showed them where the rifle was that was used to kill everyone, and he also led them to where the boat was on the property. After the search and reenactment... Oh, he stole the boat? He stole the boat, yes. And And he kept it. And he kept it. It was on the property, and he just had hid it with some brush or whatever. I know, so stupid. And the motor was there too, believe it or not. After the search and reenactment, David was charged with six counts of second degree murder. At the start of what was supposed to be David's trial on April 16th, 1984, it came out that David had accepted a plea. He agreed to plead guilty for all six counts of second degree murder, and he was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Sergeant Easton wasn't completely satisfied in this ending to the story of the family's mass murder, and he knew that David had not been completely honest with him about everything that happened that night. He just had this feeling. He decided to visit David to get the real story. He visited David on that April morning and told him that he had a feeling David hadn't told him everything. He said he was going to come back after David was sentenced and that he expected David to be straight with him then. Because then David has nothing to hide. He's already been sentenced. He's already been sentenced. Sergeant Easton, true to his word, visited David the day he'd been sentenced. David was assured by his attorney that he could tell Easton anything he wanted and that nothing could be done to him legally since he'd already been convicted and sentenced for the crimes against the Johnson-Bentley family. David gave his version of events to Sergeant Easton then. He said he first spotted Edith and George with Karen and Janet one evening on his way home from work, and he fixated on the sisters. He was fixated on a 13 and 11-year-old. Yes, he told Sergeant Easton he wanted them. He went back and spied on the family, more specifically on the girls, and realized that the only way he could get to the girls was through having to murder the adults. He's willing to kill four adults to molest two young girls. Yes. That's just so sick. It's unbelievable. He watched them for two nights for about 45 minutes each, and on the second night, he was spotted by one of the women as the adults were around the campfire. I think it was Jackie that spotted him, but I'm not positive. She started to stand up, and then he showed himself, telling her not to move, that he had a gun. Bob Johnson got up then, and David shot him in the throat, which didn't kill Bob, but caused him to fall to the ground, clutching his neck to try to stop the bleeding. Then Grandpa George ran over to the truck to try to get his rifle, and David shot him in the head next to the passenger side door. So that's why there was a hole in the passenger side door. Grandma Edith was trying to get in the camper then, and David shot her in the head too. Jackie next ran over to where the tent was, and as she was unzipping it, but before she could get inside, he snuck up behind her and shot her in the head. And that's when the girls were trying to get out of the tent. Yes. After shooting all of the adults, David was going to try to get inside the tent. He unzipped the tent and asked the girls if they were okay. The girls asked him what was going on. He told them there were some bad people, quote unquote, out there, and that their parents told him to stay with the girls so that they could get help. So Jackie and Bob are going to go get help and leave their daughters. With a stranger. Yes, with a stranger. The girls asked him if it was, quote unquote, motorcycle people who were out there, and he said, yeah, it was, and not to come out of the tent. David had to leave the girls in the tent because Bob wasn't dead. He went over and shot him again because Bob was making a lot of noise. Then, with the girls still in the tent, he put the bodies of the adults in the car. He covered everyone up with a blanket after getting them in the back seat and then went over to the tent and went inside. Once inside, he raped both girls. After he was finished, he had them help him take down the tent. Oh, man. I know. Come on. They asked where their parents were. But he told him they had gotten away and left to get help. Then they helped him clean up the area and put all the belongings in the camper, unafraid and apparently believing everything he told them. Okay, so this is some more bullshit from David. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you the author of the book, Mr. Warren, pointed out at this point in his book that he didn't understand how David thought anyone was going to believe this. He said when the shooting began, there had to be screaming for one thing. Then for him to rape the children after murdering their family and to say that they just went along with him had to be bullshit. They had to have been terrified. They were old enough to know what gunshots sounded like. 
And they were probably crying hysterically when a strange man popped into their tent. I mean, I'm sure they were completely freaked out. Absolutely. They were just raped, but they weren't afraid of him. They weren't afraid of him. After cleaning up the campsite, David drove with the girls to his cabin. He had the girls set up the tent and told them not to leave the area because the bikers were still on the loose and they were looking for the girls. He left them at the ranch and disposed of the bodies and the vehicle. I like how you call it a ranch. I know. (laughs) I'm just pointing that out to our listeners. It's it's, It's made from material stolen. It's in the remote woods. (laughs) The author called it a ranch. I mean, cabin, ranch, shack. You went from a shack (laughs) to a a ranch. ranch. (laughs) Okay, so they're at the ranch. They're at the ranch. (laughs) Those poor girls. I mean, that is literally the stuff nightmares are made of. You're taken to someone's shack in the Mm, woods. In the woods. After your family's been slaughtered. Absolutely. David then drove the truck and camper back to where the girls were and told them he wanted to hide them on the ranch (laughs) and said he had saved their parents and helped them get away, like helped the parents get away. He told Sergeant Eastham, quote, they really thought I was their hero, end quote. Oh, my God. David kept the girls for close to a week. (gasps) Oh, yeah. He kept them for a fucking week? A fucking week, saying they were happy and trusted him. Which I really and that's just find stupid. That's just so stupid. So they must have been bound and stuck in a shack. They had to be. They had to be. And he probably continued to rape them. And where is his roommate? That that's what I was about? wondering. Where are these guys that lived with him? These other criminals? I don't know. I don't, don't want to know. know. On Friday, he said he killed the adults on Monday. He told the girls he was going to take them to meet their parents, but they ended up just trekking through the woods before he returned them back to the cabin. On Sunday, he asked Karen to go for a walk with him because, and Karen's the younger one, to go for a walk with him because he wanted to talk to her about a personal matter. What? She followed him into the woods near the ranch, and he told her he had to take a piss and asked her to turn around. When she did, he shot her in the back of the head. He went back to where Janet was, and she asked where her sister was. David said he had tied her to a tree. That's all he said. And then that night, David was in the camper with Janet and they talked all night because she was a virgin and didn't know much about sex. So they couldn't do that. With her sister tied to a tree. Uh Uh-huh. In the woods. In the woods. And we're supposed to believe Janet didn't hear the gunshot. Right. Exactly. This is just more bullshit. I'm assuming some truth is weaved into this. Probably. And he does admit to some things later that I'll tell you about in a minute. But yeah. This is what he's telling Sergeant Easton the day he got sentenced. So the following day, he asked Janet to walk into the woods with him, and that's when he shot her in the head, like he did with Karen after saying he had to pee and asked her to turn around. The next night, he loaded all of the bodies into the car and set it on fire. It had been 10 days since he had killed the adults, so they sat in the car undiscovered somewhere. He then focused on disposing of the camper because by then the media was reporting on the disappearance of the family. He originally wanted to drive the camper off a cliff, but had to burn it out when it got stuck in the mud. After Sergeant Eastham had interviewed David, his partner, Detective Liable, went out to David's cabin. He found a spot where David had carved DS plus JJ into one of the logs on the cabin. Gross. Isn't that gross? Janet Johnson and David Shearing. The author of the book, Mr. Warren, interviewed David some years later after his conviction. David added more to the story than what he gave to Sergeant Easton. He told Mr. Warren he first saw the girls playing at the abandoned prison site and became intrigued with them. He watched them play tag and run around. He said, quote, I don't know what happened to me. It's like everything in my mind was gone and all I could think about was those girls, end quote. He was obsessed and couldn't rest until he had them for his own. Other things that came out during their discussion was David admitted that Jackie had been opening the tent door when he shot her and that her body had fallen right in front of the girls in the entryway to the tent, holding it open. David locked eyes with the girls then, and he stood behind their mother's body still holding the rifle he used to kill her. David also admitted to what happened in the tent. He said he had Janet tie up Karen's hands and tried to get Janet to take off her clothes. He said he didn't rape the girls because he couldn't maintain an erection, but he did feel Janet up and said he wanted to make her feel good, which grossed me out. 
like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, that's, yeah. Oh, I know. He said that he made friends with the girls after taking them to his cabin, but was asked, well, then why did you kill them if you were friends with them? David said that Karen wasn't going to understand and that, quote, she didn't work with me, end quote. She kept fighting him and couldn't figure out what he wanted her to do. He even tried to get her to comply by spending a whole day with her alone, showing her what he wanted her to do, but she wouldn't stop crying. What did he want her to and do? That's what I don't know, but that's what the wording he used. I'm imagining, because that's where my mind's going, is that it's something sexual. Yeah. And that she was just young and she didn't get it. And he probably wanted it to seem not forced, like have her go along with whatever's mm-hmm. he's enacting in his mind. Exactly. About so, him being a hero. Right. And so it was just all completely gross. He admitted to Mr. Warren that during the first 10 years of his life in prison, he continued to think about and fantasize about the assaults he committed on the sisters. Really? Mm-hmm. While in prison for 10 years, David married a woman named Heather. Lucky girl. She married him knowing he killed six members of the same family and that he held a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old captive for almost a week. And he's... Either uh, raped them or tried to. Right. Thank you. And he's a perv. And he's a perv. Heather and David are granted conjugal visits, two 72-hour visits twice a month. Damn. I know. It sounds like the perfect marriage, actually. I (laughs) I think they're getting laid more often than some married people. Where they get to live like regular married couple in a small housing unit on the prison grounds. It looks like a regular apartment. It's got a kitchen, a bathroom, a bed. I'm so enraged right now. I know. I'm so disgusted. Heather has said of him that, quote, I know my husband and I've watched him cry like you'd never believe. Nobody wishes the past could be changed more than him, end quote. Gonna puke. I know. I can think of a lot of people more than him. David Shearing changed his name in prison to David Ennis, which was his mother's maiden name. He's still incarcerated and was most recently denied parole for the sixth time in September 2021. He finally admitted to the parole board that he only wanted Janet and killed everyone in order to kidnap her. So did he not kidnap Karen? He kidnapped Karen. But he really, but the focus was Janet. Yeah, and Karen was just kind of there, he said. He also admitted to having violent sexual fantasies since he was a teenager that included rape and murder. During his parole hearing, he apologized to the family and said he has great feelings of regret and shame for what he did. The parole board was told that David has been attending sex offender programs at the prison and works in the prison chapel. Was he trying to get released? Because that's probably not the way to do it. To I know. Say about all these that's violent what I was thinking. Why would on. you say this at the parole hearing? But I guess he was being honest. Wow, that's a change. I know. I would be like, no, I do not have any violent sexual no, fantasies. No, not at all. They are never. all gone. Never. It's over. I've never had one in my life. As a matter of fact, <laughs> never. Despite this, his parole application was denied. And the board said, quote, there are overwhelming negative aspects in your case. The gravity and severity of your offending, it's of the utmost level. It was very violent and it devastated so many people. When we look at your assessed risks together with your diagnosis of sexual sadism, which largely remains unchanged, the most appropriate place for you to make gains is in the safety and security of the institution, end quote. I mean, he's got... Three meals a day. He's getting laid. There you go. <laughs> How and, bad can it be? And the public is safe. It's win-win. That's I'm, so, I'm so angry. I mean, it's been almost 40 years. How old is he? He was born in 59. He's 62, 63. Is he still married? I believe so. I Googled it. Well, Google has all the answers. Google has all the answers. I mean, I Googled Heather or David Shearing's wife, David Ennis' wife. I did. I believe they're still married. And I know he's still incarcerated because the last parole hearing was September. So that is the Wells Gray Park murders. And this case was suggested to us by one of our members, our Patreon members, Brian B. So we appreciate it, Brian. This was a great story. Thanks, Brian. I mean, not a great story, but you know what I mean. I'm a sad. A very sad one. And I had never heard of it. I hadn't either until Brian sent us that. Yeah, so thank you, Brian. Before we go, please... Hit the subscriber follow button on whatever app you're listening to us on. And if you'd like more information and to see photos, you can go to our website, 
crimesandconsequences.com. Took you a second. It did. I was going to say TNT. You can find us on social media at Hardcore True Crime on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, please check it out. And if you are wondering how to get more episodes, go to patreon.com slash TNT Crimes. You can find out how to become a member. For a very small fee every month, you can get exclusive episodes. We have full episodes, mini episodes, commercial free episodes, early release, and we go live. In reality, what the public hears on your apps right now is only about a third of what Crimes and Consequences actually is. The biggest portion of us is our patreon.com TNT Crimes site. So check it out. And also our Apple channel on Apple Podcast. That's where you can get all the goodies Tanya was talking about. So check it out. (laughs) We give shout outs to our new members. And I believe you have the list, Tanya. I do. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So we would like to thank our newest members. Jordy M. Paula S. Miss Shives. Kathleen L. Mo R. Rayana G. Caitlin P. Patricia B, Jennifer C, Rachel B, Tracy S, Dominique B, Cassandra, Alexis B, Nicole B, Jessica M. We got a lot of Bs. I know. Yaritza. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. She did. (laughs) Amy N, Isaiah, Cassie H, Kristen C, Mindy with an I, and Reagan. Or Regan. I think it's Reagan. I don't, I don't know those I millennials. Don't know. I don't know. I'm sure that's a millennial. <laughs> it's a cute name. Regan or Reagan. I mean, people I pronounce that. yours all the time. Mispronounce yours all the time. So. Talia. Talia. Mine gets mispronounced too, believe it or not. Anyway, so thank you very much. Yay. Yay. Welcome to the club. Yay. And I think that's everything. That sounds good to me. All right, Talia, until our next episode. Do not kill each other. Bye. Bye. Bye.